Hi everyone, uh, really nice to be here this afternoon. Hopefully you can all see my presentation, so that's good. Um, so I think today uh, there's so much to talk about with this topic. Um, the British Army in the First World War, the use of horses, um, it really is a vast, vast subject. So before we kick off, um, I want to kind of just quickly run through what I'm going to do today because I've chosen to give an overview um, of the topic rather than covering anything in any great detail. So I'm sure um, this is going to bring up a lot of questions at the end, but I thought this was the best way to do it to give the clearest picture of um, the horse's participation in the war. So what we're going to do um, is have a quick look at the background. So what happened with the British Army and horses before the First World War, look at the equid participants, so who were these animals um, and, and why were they chosen? Um, supply and demand. So we're going to look at the remount services, uh, where these animals came from, the roles that they did, and really the horse's experience in the war, along with touching very briefly on the legacy. And it's a big legacy, so it will be brief at the end. So why the long face, a.k.a. the horse question? Um, before we dive into discussing the role of horses in the First World War, it's worth taking a bit of time to look at what came before it. So the British Army was in um, somewhat of a unique position in terms of equine war planning in the run up to the First World War. And this was due to its experiences in the Boer War. It's fair to say that the war in South Africa had been an absolute disaster from the horse's perspective. Um, the newly created remount and veterinary services were very much thrown in the deep end um, and providing care and supplying the animals in a conflict which was thousands of miles away from home. And due to a number of critical failures in this, um, it resulted in severe equine losses um, of around 70%. Um, statistics vary on this, but um, that's a nice average. And um, I just put my glasses on because I realised I couldn't see anything. Uh, there were many reasons for um, this poor um, outcome for horses, including uh, inadequate vetting of horses in the first place, so picking horses that weren't suitable for warfare, a lack of acclimatisation period um, on arrival to South Africa, um, for a few, huge number of these horses were um, brought to South Africa from abroad um, and the voyage on the ships was incredibly strenuous. Animals lost a lot of condition during the voyage and then to be sent to work almost immediately upon arrival um, was incredibly um, detrimental and often fatal. Transport across the country and um, once they did arrive and were sent to the battlefields was very difficult. These battlefields were you know, often far away from the ports and um, they were sent on long rail journeys in totally inadequate um, rail transport. So often these rail carriages were open to the elements. There was very little water and forage available for the horses. So disease was rife and again, the horses lost more condition. And this was even before they had reached um, the fighting. And to top it all off, um, the remount department and the veterinary services at the time failed to work together effectively. So this all resulted in a huge amount of animal suffering um, and the losses that were incurred um, really were a national outrage. And to look at these failings, um, you know, an inquiry was set up um, to assess how the military could do better next time. Um, and it very much highlighted the importance of horses in war and more than that, really, that when their needs were overlooked, when the individual needs of the horses were overlooked, that it severely impacted operations. It had a very big impact on military operations. So what followed was a period of reform for the remount and veterinary services to complement the wider decentralisation plans put into motion um, by Secretary of State for War, Hal Dane. Uh, and great attention was paid to things like the number of horses that were available in Britain for the use by the army. And um, the impact of mechanisation of society was having on this because this was a big issue. And how the horses could be um, most effectively and most quickly mobilised in the event of a war. In addition to this, the army veterinary service was expanded and reorganised um, at the formation of the army veterinary corps in 1906, rather than having regimental veterinary officers, which proved wholly inadequate. Um, and as part of these reforms, and um, very importantly, there was a national horse census, which took place in 1912. And this is something that actually Germany had been doing for decades earlier. And it provided vital information to the military on the types of horses that were available in Britain to be requisitioned um, and helped them to then plan 
the mobilization of horses um, at a period when really political tensions were increasing and the risk of war was looming. And this all would pay dividends um, in 1914 when um, forces began to mobilize. And we'll come back to how that supply and demand process worked shortly. So let's take a little moment to look at our protagonists. Um, who were the equid participants of the Great War? And something we don't perhaps often ask, why? Um, man and horse, of course, have faced war together for thousands of years. And as such, the war horse has very much come to be viewed as a willing participant in battle. So we often think of the horses as fighting for the cause alongside their riders. And I'm thinking of famous war horses here that come to mind. Um, they've often been used as a symbol of victory as a result, you know, glory in battle, righteousness. And all you've got to do is look at statues that, you know, particularly in London, you know, you can't move for seeing a military statue with a rider mounted on a horse. And this is true across the globe. Um, war horses have been mythologized in many different cultures. Um, and as part of that, often personified with loyalty, bravery, um, and other things like this, which realistically um, doesn't really define the horse's place in battle. So we've got to try and separate out this culture of the war horse and our sentimental tendencies to romanticise it with the facts. So let's look briefly at why the horse has been utilised and exploited by man for so long to support and facilitate war aims. And the first thing to remember that I put here on the slide is that horses are herd animals and um, they feel most comfortable in large numbers and they're naturally responsive to leadership. So this has a series of implications on the battlefield. They very much dislike being alone and they are driven to seek safety in numbers. And this is a defence mechanism. So what happens when horses are threatened is they stampede. And this is something that the remount services and anybody dealing with horses during the First World War would have been well aware of. And indeed, there are numerous accounts of horse stampedes happening, happening at depots and there were procedures put in place in how to deal with them. But this, um, whilst this was also a problem, it was also utilised in the form of controlled stampedes, i.e. cavalry charges. Um, and you know, in addition to this kind of herding nature, so the horses obviously come together to, to run, to really get to safety. The main reason they do this is because they're following their leaders. So as herding creatures, they really respond to having a natural hierarchy put in place. So whilst we tend to kind of look at this as loyalty or obedience, and indeed those are characteristics that follow, really the root of this is the horse finding someone to follow in their rider, developing that bond, um, and then this makes them easier to train and direct. So in harnessing these natural instincts and these, this kind of psychology of the horse, man has been able to take um, advantage of its physical um, attributes. So providing speed and endurance that man um, would otherwise lack and allowing them to travel further and faster in battle. So just coming back to how all of this links to the British Army plans and procedures. Well, of course, not all horses are created equally. Um, so the best way to take advantage of these natural characteristics was to make sure that the right types of horses were acquired for the right jobs. So they all have similar psychologies, they all follow these natural instincts, but actually individual types of horses are very different. So firstly, um, I mean, these can be broken down to four main types essentially. And firstly, the heavy draft horse. Um, this is actually my mum Shire horse, which I managed to slide into the presentation. So say hello to Pip. Um, Pip is a stock working horse, like, uh, she's a Shire. Um, and breeds such as the Shire and Clydesdales were popular at the time of the First World War used in agriculture. And in the war, they were used to pull heavy loads in pairs due to their brute strength, essentially. Um, Although they have an extremely sensitive nature and they're feathered legs, so you can see the long fur um, on Pip's legs and over her hooves here, they proved to be um, a bit of a problem, particularly on the Western Front. So I'll come, I'll come back to this a little later on when we talk about some of the issues that um, horses faced in terms of um, wounds and illness. Um, but, you know, these were great animals for pulling heavy artillery um, and really their strengths, not fast, but for strengths, these were the best animals for the job. The second type, type of horse was the light draft. So this, as you can see, um, is an example actually from the um, types of horses um, suitable for army remounts booklet. And this is a lovely um, light draft. So he's still very strong, um, hunter types, very muscular, 
able to pull heavy loads as well, but also um, much more agile and quicker than um, the heavy draft types. The third type are the riding horses, so warm blood types used for officer charges and cavalry for their speed and endurance. And finally, um, my favourite type of equid participant, the uh, pack horses, so um, mules, ponies and sometimes donkeys, often quite overlooked, these um, little beasts of burden. So once the right types of horses were found, um, it was important then to make sure that the individual specimens were of the right condition and size, as learnt from the issues in the bar war where any old horse was just taken pretty much. Um, and so this document was issued in 1911, which provided details on what remount officers were to look for when purchasing animals. And we'll come back to this when I look at um, the supply shortly. Before we do, um, I want to look at the other major equid participant and my, my favourite, um, this is the mule, uh, the offspring of a, a male donkey and a female horse. It's a less glamorous cousin of the horse um, and therefore he's really been covered far less in um, First World War historiography, uh, very much a case of bad PR unfortunately, particularly in Britain. He's um, really been jeered as a, a somewhat unnatural creature, um, though popular across the world and particularly in America, just never really got on with um, the British establishment and wasn't really embraced into British culture, uh, very much a kind of psychological contamination um, due to perhaps being kind of looked down on and, and really their full value was not recognised. Um, certainly problems with the reputation remain today, so we know the mules are often thought of as very stubborn, as vicious and generally um, just not very nice creatures, um, but actually they are incredibly intelligent um, as there's a little bit of soldier testimony here from Alexander Serb on the tests. Um, and there are dozens of um, kind of testimony from soldiers with things like this specifically referencing mules. Um, scientific studies have actually shown that mules um, have an ability to think um, beyond any given moment in time. So they are much better at comprehending their place and even some argue their role in situations far better than a horse would be. And this links in with some things that um, I found in um, soldier testimony as well around medical officers commenting that mules carrying wounded seem to have a sense of their responsibility and would tread extra carefully and that kind of thing. But most importantly, to get the best out of a mule, you really have to understand him. Um, and when they are at their best, they are incredibly valuable resource for the army because they inherit the best characteristics of both their parents, so both horses and donkeys. One of the most important things is that they can see and coordinate all four legs far better than a horse, so they are extremely nimble and sure-footed. Um, they are also exceedingly strong and tough for their size. Um, the other big benefit of a mule over a horse is they genuinely enjoy, or they genuinely seem to enjoy working and being busy. They are not good when they're kept idle, but actually working and being challenged is something they tend to thrive on. Um, and as a result of this, and, and particularly as a result of their breeding, um, they are far more resilient physically, um, as well as mentally, I might add, but physically. So this made a huge difference um, to military operations when using mules versus horses. So. Um, just to illustrate this, one estimate is that during the um, Third Battle of Ypres, three quarters of the ammunition was actually um, delivered by mule, yet only one mule for every four and a half horses was invalided. So that gives you an idea of um, some of the benefits that the mule had. Um, but it wasn't always appreciated by the British Army. I think that's the key thing to take away from this. Um, the Quartermaster General very much preferred light draft horses and didn't really believe that um, mules had anything to offer any benefits over that. But by the end of 1914, um, when it became apparent that the war was not going to be over quickly and um, the supply of light draft horses was really waning, the British Army began trialling using imported mules and essentially rapidly change their mind. Um, and that's partly what my research is focusing on at the moment. Okay, so we've looked at our, our main two players and of course, um, the donkey was also used in the First World War though um, much less um, often than ho horses and mules. And to be honest with you, the donkey really has uh, many of the same characteristics as a mule, but they're much smaller. So therefore they kind of lose some of their value although they were um, used in the hotter theatres or hotter climates. They were um, very, very useful there, particularly in places like Gallipoli. Um, 
But how did the British Army get their hands on hundreds of thousands of equines it needed to supply the army? Well, really comes down to um, a combination of careful planning, preparation and a bit of ad hoc learning. Um, can't really escape that in the First World War. So the first thing to look at is um, how the home supply of horses was accessed. And this was via something called impressment. So when the First World War broke out, the British Army had only around 25,000 horses. Makes little financial sense for the military to have a large stock of hundreds of thousands of horses in peacetime and um, caring for them, that kind of thing would just be completely not cost effective. So in the reforms that were made and um, that I mentioned earlier, a call up system was established, um, which worked by subsidies. So owners of horses would sign up and they'd volunteer to be paid an annual fee on the agreement that they would keep their horses um, in good condition and well looked after. And in the event of a war, um, be happy to hand them over to the army. And the military, of course, had the ability to enforce compulsory purchase of animals as well. Um, for a fair fee, I might add, um, the fees were you know, very, very generous really at the time compared to if you were just selling your horse regularly. Um, and all this worked out pretty well. So um, there were some issues with overpayment of some horses um, that perhaps weren't in great condition, but compared to um, the Boer War, um, the types of horses that were brought into the British Army were generally a very, very good health. Um, and most horse owners were very cooperative with these schemes. So within the 12 days, um, the British Army had successfully mobilised around about 165,000 horses, which is a, a feat really um, in its own. But with the rapid expansion of the BEF and the requirement to, of course, horse in new armies, um, it far outstrips the number of horses that were available in Britain. So this was um, a big concern. And so we come back to the importance of planning. Um, and this, again, was central to um, the British Army's pre-war improvements in this area. And it was ensuring access to the international horse market that was most important. So to supply the first four new armies, um, Britain required an additional 245,000 animals, um, the majority of which would need to be imported. Purchasing commissions were sent to Australia, South America, and most importantly, North America, which would supply the majority of remounts. With the total horse population, of 30 million, um, America um, was the biggest um, single country um, that Britain imported horses from. A total of 8 million horses in the, in the country were already broken in and trained. So it was a huge pool of resource that um, Britain had access to. And this was really invaluable. And just to illustrate this, um, got some stats here. So between 1914 and 1918, a cargo of between 500,000 animals left the US for Europe every one and a half days. And Britain spent an estimated 36.5 million on horses and mules from the US during the war. So that is it's an awful lot of horses, an awful lot of money. The majority um, of good stock of horses were located in the agricultural belt of the Midwestern states. Um, and obviously shipping these animals to Europe and to um, the theatres of war was a huge, huge logistical challenge. Um, the horses were purchased from dealers all over the states. The remount officers um, were sent um, all around the country, essentially, um, to scope out animals. Minimum standards had to be met, and then a very complex transportation process um, was constructed. Um, the railways across the United States, animals were shipped to depots for review and purchased by the remount service, at which point they were branded with the broad arrow. And then they were sent via rail ports um, to the East Coast, where they were shipped to the UK um, or directly to France. And the shining stars of the US horse market were the US light draft with its very even temperament, strength and power, and the US mule. Um, the light draft was particularly important, um, often bred with strains of the heavy draft. So um, things like the Shire and the Clydesdale all mixed into um, their breeding. And most importantly, um, a horse called the Percheron, um, which was um, arguably one of the most important single breeds of horse in the First World War. Um, Sidney Gautry has described it as the Allies' most successful war horse. So um, very strong in the neck. Um, it's quite short um, in, in the leg and back. So although it's a large horse, um, it kind of got a low center of gravity and it makes them very well suited to drawing much needed um, artillery and heavy loads but it's also an incredibly chilled out and nimble horse for its size so really um, kind of suited the somewhat chaotic obviously nature of the battlefields. Only four months into the war then um, animals had overtaken at coal and grain exports from the US in total value 
The voyage to the UK or to France took around two to four weeks. Um, most cases, horses were stabled on the upper decks of ships um, to ensure better ventilation. And the types of um, stabling used on ships throughout the war um, changed as lessons were learned. So originally, um, horses were penned in single stables. Then they were, um, we learned, we learn and the British learned lessons and actually moved to using pens instead. It's better for hygiene and, and much easier to keep an eye on the horse's condition and allowed them freedom so that they were less likely to get injured. Um, although the journey was far from um, pleasant, wastage figures were quite low, so only 2% of horses died during transit. Um, and the first of some 700,000 remounts from the US and Canada um, arrived in October 1914. Um, horses were then taken to remount depots, so these raw recruits needed to be whipped into shape. Um, there were four main depots, um, one at Shirehampton, um, one at Omskirk, uh, Swadling, and then latterly um, Romsey, which opened in 1915. So in addition to these, these main depo depots, there were smaller depots which um, worked to provide training for specific duties. Um, and the job of these depots was, as I said, to, to really get the horses fit, um, make sure that they were suitable um, for being shipped to the um, remount depots in France, where they were then sent on to units as required. So we come to looking at what our four-legged friends did as part um, of the army and what better place to start than the much maligned cavalry. And, um, you know, the cavalry's had a really rough ride of it over the past um, 100 years or so, pun absolutely intended there. Um, but, you know, it's been linked to some of the most damaging myths about the First World War, not notably the lions led by donkeys myth, um, which has pretty much embedded itself in British culture. This idea that um, British army generals were all old fashioned, uncaring cavalrymen. Um, and therefore that they were incapable of modern military thinking because the cavalry can't possibly have place in modern warfare. I'm not going to go into too much detail because um, this really is a whole talk on its own to discuss um, why I personally very much disagree with this view. Um, but essentially, they were a tactically effective force. They had been through a series of reform and actually, you know, they had quite forward thinking doctrine. For anybody who's interested in this, I you know, thoroughly recommend Stephen Badsey's work um, and his book, um, Doctrine and Reform of the British Cavalry, which actually I have here. So a little plug for Stephen. Um, the cavalry do tend to be viewed with this um, more positively in 1914 and 1918. So during the initial British engagements and the retreat from Mons and um, later during the Hundred Days Offensive. Um, usually the reasons given for this um, is the more open um, open kind of landscapes and more mobile warfare conditions. Another reason why the cavalry actions in Palestine are often cited as being far more um, useful and far more successful. And this is true. Um, those conditions did suit the cavalry better, but it does really a disservice to the cavalry's actions in 1915 through to 1917 on the Western Front because they played an important role throughout the war, not just at the beginning of the, and the end. Conditions on the Western Front were far from ideal and they certainly presented many practical challenges to the mounted soldier, but um, no more really than they did to tanks or any other form of mobile warfare. Trenches were bridged, cavalry tracks were made, and, and much of the criticism heaped on the cavalry for um, being operationally ineffective was really due to a lack of vision on how best to use um, the cavalry, so the wider strategic decisions, rather than um, the cavalry themselves being ineffective. So ultimately, um, you know, for me, the cavalry represented the only viable arm of exploitation available um, to the British Army throughout the war. The fact that the big breakthrough didn't occur on the Western Front can't be blamed on them being ineffective. That being said, um, and I could go on about that for way too long, I'm already running a little bit behind time. The horse as a cavalry mount was really um, a supporting equine actor in their um, first world war story. And the leading roles went to animals working in logistics. So the first of these big players was um, horses working to move and supply artillery. And the Great War was a revolutionary period for artillery in terms of both technological developments and its uses from huge bombardments on the Somme to the concentrated barrages used in bite and hold tactics at places like Messines in 1917. So whatever way artillery was being used, it needed to be moved into position and supplied with ammunition. Otherwise, it was pretty much useless. Without the horse and mule, this would have been nigh on impossible. At the beginning of the war, um, light draft horses were preferred for these roles, but their combination for their combination of strength and stamina, 
as we've already discussed, but when it became apparent that good quality light draft horses were getting harder and harder to find, um, and this is uh, really down to the wider mechanisation of society and, and kind of uh, a failure to concentrate on breeding good quality light draft horses, just in general, not, not just for military purposes, um, then other horses um, were turned to to help with these duties. So heavy drafts were used, um, albeit came with their own disadvantages. Um, but also, most notably, uh, mules were used to fill up more of the roles um, of light draft horses. Royal Horse Artillery Training um, had a very strong focus on horsemanship um, and was ex extremely high standards because obviously they recognised how important the horses were in their operations. Um, and of course, they were essential to the Royal Field Artillery. Um, just to illustrate the numbers of horses used, um, the expansion of equine, equine requirements to artillery regiments um, the RA establishment rose from um, 6,106 to 24,868. So a huge, huge expansion in numbers there. And a wonderful photo to hear from, um, actually from the National Army Museum archives of a howitzer team with their draft horses. Um, just an example to, to kind of give you a feel of the weights that these animals had to, had to pull. Um, you know, they were pulling guns of sort of like one and a half tons plus a limber plus rider plus saddlery, weapons, ammunition, and they all had to work in unison. So this was a very uh, difficult and skillful job for not just the horses, but for, for the men involved as well. Um, next up, um, the most, well, I think is the most interesting area of the war, um, and certainly of the war horses experience, um, was their role in the Army Service Corps. Uh, the British Army had um, limited mechanised transport when war broke out. And though this number increased dramatically um, throughout the war, and there was a heavy focus on embracing um, mechanization, uh, really it was horsepower that supplied and resupplied the British Army time and time again. Um, on the damaged and, and shell-scarred landscapes, particularly of the Western Front, uh, the horse um, and horse transport was the only way to, to move ammunition and supplies to forward lines, um, because essentially mechanical transport could not traverse the difficult terrain, um, and it was difficult to ensure maintenance of the vehicles, particularly in the mud and the wet. Um, it was much easier to look after horses, although this had a number of huge challenges just on its own. Um, the majority of horses were in the hands of the Army Service, Car Army Service Corps, very unglamorous, but they were responsible for pretty much everything uh, from stores to warehousing, railways, catering, all manner of um, horse-drawn transport, and they underwent a huge, huge expansion. So to illustrate the scale, the Army Service Corps provided fodder for around 29,000 horses um, at the outbreak of the war, and at the end of the war, this had risen to nearly 900,000. Um, horses and mules were used in a proportion of around three to one, um, often pulling the trusty general service wagon, um, in teams of two, four or six. And um, my current research is looking uh, very much at how um, the use of particular types of horses and mules changed throughout the war, um, particularly regards to preference towards mules in um, certain engagements. As we mentioned with the artillery, um, dra wagon driving, dragon driving? Wagon driving um, is a very skillful business. Um, not just a case of tacking your horse up and shouting it forward. Drivers have to understand their horses. They have got to make sure that they're working equally together um, and it help them in negotiating the routes and, and all the challenges of drawing different types of weight over different types of terrain. And a lack of experienced drivers certainly caused issues. Um, wanted to mention um, these guys, um, the World's Wagoners, um, the Wagoners Special Reserve Team, they were a territorial unit raised in 1912 um, and they were raised by Sir Mark Sykes who was a Boer War veteran and he really understood the importance of logistics and moving um, and supplying a moving army and that skilled drivers were essential to this essentially. So he um, raised um, this unit uh, from his local area in um, Yorkshire um, from pole wagons that were being used just daily um, in and around uh, the local area. And they were very, very skilled men in driving horses. Um, around about 1,100 men served with the wagoners and they were among the first to be called up and served with the Army Service Corps as part of the war. Um, a super, super interesting little niche if anybody fancies diving down that rabbit hole. Um, having looked briefly at the roles then, um, Let's take some time to cover some of the other roles of horses that we might not usually consider. Um, cavalry logistics is something that pops to mind almost immediately, but um, horses played um, a vital role in 
total war. So, you know, during the First World War, um, Britain entered um, a state of total war with industry um, and civilians mobilising on the home front to support the war effort. And this meant that the work of civilians um, and civilian horses became geared towards supporting the war effort. During this period, although mechanisation of society was well underway, horses still played a huge role in transport and logistics in everyday life. And here's a photo um, of one such horse. I love this photo. I'm working on Liverpool timber docks in 1906. Um, and it really gives us an example of the types of jobs that they were doing. And as the war took hold, the importance of these horses working in industry very much increased from those working in um, shipyards, so shipbuilding, to those in logistics, helping to transport all manner of goods um, and materials um, across the country um, to supply and support the war effort, um, particularly in France and Belgium. And without these horses, you know, those army supplies and functionality would have been severely hampered. In addition, there were a number of key um, non-combat roles of horses, um, first of which is the Canadian Forestry Corps, totally worth a mention here. Um, during the First World War, there was a huge demand for timber for use on all fronts for, um, for trenches, for construction of railways, storage crates, buildings, you know, could go on and on but wood was in huge demand and whilst Britain had the resource it very much lacked the skills to efficiently harvest timber enter the Canadian Forestry Corps uh, formed in 14th November 1916 by the end of the war thousands of Canadians had served with the Corps and it's estimated that Canadian lumbermen um, produced over half of all lumber used by Allied forces on the Western Front so that's huge um, vital to their contribution um, and their success was the horse because it would have been impossible to move the timber um, without these heavy draft horses that have been um, very much kind of um, immortalized in the paintings of Alfred Munnings, particular favorite of mine. Um, and we can't look at really um, horses working on the home front um, and behind the lines without looking at the, the Women's Land Army formed in 1917 um, by the Board of Agriculture uh, the main aim was to increase food production um, during the war and around 23,000 women were recruited to work full time on the land. Um, they were several different sections, so agriculture, forage and timber cutting. Um, but pretty much all of these roles um, meant that involved women um, working with horses and getting used to their care and some even training in farriery. So um, and I'm flying through here because I'm aware of the time. Um, but can't not mention this, one of my favourite areas of the horse's contribution to the war. Um, and that's the, the, the part that it played in um, morale and in, and in keeping morale high among troops. So there's a, a very much a growing interest in um, the role of equines in um, maintaining morale and in the nature and dynamic of the soldier horse relationship. And I fully recommend Jane Flynn's work on this um, if you have a chance to look into it. She's really explored um, the importance of the soldier horse bond in depth and come to the conclusion that really this um, relationship was very complex, but extremely important to day to day military life. The British Army very much encouraged their men to care for and bond with their horses because they recognised that this effectively meant, um, you know, well kept horses, less expense for the military and a more effective fighting force. Um, this had several um, important influences on morale provided soldiers with a connection to the outside world. Um, so very much allowed for expressions of compassion and familiarity with the home front as well, um, providing a bit of a, a touchstone, I guess, to domestic life at home um, and away from the, the horrors of war. Um, horses on the battlefield are mentioned very frequently in soldier memoirs, with many commenting that the suffering of men they could get used to and almost became numb to, but the suffering of horses was something which um, many you know, couldn't get over and that stayed with them for a long, long time. Um, divisional horse shows were regularly arranged um, and helped break up the inertia of war, as well as encouraging healthy competition among troops, which reinforced esprit de corps, as well as um, very much reaffirm reaffirming belief in um, one's unit. So it helped to develop and strengthen inter rank relationships, essentially. Um, and that was, you know, vital to an army success in battle. Um, also, I try and squeeze this guy into every one of my um, war horse talks. This is Tiny. Um, he was a mascot and he was found um, lying by the roadside by the 26th Divisional Train of the Army Service Corps, who adopted him as their mascot during the Salonika campaign. Um, he used to wander around the camp, very much settled into army life and his big um his favorite thing apparently was drinking tea so he could drink up to nine cups in succession which i feel like i 
I'm definitely um, challenging him on through lockdown when I've been sat at my desk. Um, so coming towards the end of the talk, um, I just want to look briefly at, um, at the Army Veterinary Corps and, and what the horse, the war was like for the horse individually. So um, obviously the battlefield is far from the horse's natural environment. Um, and as we touched upon earlier, uh, the key desire of a horse is to find safety and to find their place in the herd. Psychologically then, um, the sights and sounds and smells of battle, um, very challenging. Um, and some breeds dealt with it better than others. Some individual horses dealt with it better than others. Um, actually, it's quite easy to train horses to get used to um, scary things, as anybody who's got a horse will know. This conditioning takes a lot of work, um, but it can be done. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, of course, the, the troops had um, very close bonds with their animals, and they wanted to um, often put their needs before their own. Physically, however, um, much was asked of horses and mules throughout the war. Gunfire and shelling was a threat, um, most notably for transport animals. Um, who were, um, you know, their lines were often targeted by the enemy. A new weapon, gas, um, was another concern. Although in the scheme of things, this really accounted for very, very few equine casualties. Um, although, you know, the pictures of horses and gas masks circulate regularly, very, very few were really um, wounded by gas. The big threats were the bottom three I've mentioned here. So uh, the weather, general living conditions, um, which tended to result in um, disease and exhaustion. On the Western Front, um, this more often than not meant mud and a lack of shelter from the rain and the wind, um, difficulty exercising animals behind the lines, something perhaps we don't often think about. When they weren't working, animals were just stood in the mud and damp. Um, this caused a variety of health problems, um, blindness associated with bacteria in the mud, to no end of leg, um, hoof problem, lameness was a common issue, and um, skin conditions. Um, and these conditions also you know, greatly hampered providing fodder and water to the horses. And all of this combined meant that the animals would quickly lose condition and thus were more likely to be susceptible, susceptible to disease. Um, on other fronts, different problems, but similar, but different. So if we look at Sinai and Palestine, uh, the desert terrain was very unforgiving. Logistical challenges in supplying um, forces on long marches caused casualties among equines, mainly due to debility um, caused by lack of water, essentially. When water was found, so if they were digging wells, the water was often quite unpalatable. Some horses just wouldn't drink it, further reducing their condition. The harsh temperatures were also very challenging for some animals, um, big extremes. So the, the hot of the day and the cold of night um, meant it took a lot of energy for horses to just exist. Um, mules dealt with the extremes and temperatures far better, um, but they still suffered under the, the long marches and constant exposure to the sun. The worst period for poor condition of horses on the Western Front was early to mid-1917, coinciding with a number of major offences. Um, the demand on artillery horses markedly increased um, and poor weather conditions meant that many animals were simply worked to death. Um, contagious diseases such as mange, um, this horse here, poor, poor little sod, um, he is suffering from mange. Um, and it required very careful management from um, the Army Veterinary Corps to avoid large scale infections um, that were seen in, in the Boer War. These were generally contained very well, it has to be said, um, and treated by isolating affected animals and disinfecting them. Um, the Army Veterinary Corps did a stellar job in the First World War. Um, it's such a huge part of the horses' war that um, it really deserves a, a big talk to its um, all onto itself. But just as a quick overview, um, ABC was of course responsible for medical treatment and disease prevention. Prevention is key here um, of equines throughout the war. They also had to keep the um, army supplied with things like farriers, um, which was a huge ta task in itself. Um, the Quartermaster General Department provided something like 60 million horseshoes throughout the war. Um, and I love this quote here, no shoe, no foot, no foot, no horse, no horse, no transport, no transport, no battalion. Um, and that pretty much sums up the importance of the farrier in the First World War. Um, by the end of 1914, the ABC had um, around about 360 odd officers, a further 1100 or so commissioned throughout the war. And by 1918, almost half of veterinary surgeons in Britain were serving in the ABC. Mobile veterinary sections were established, um, uh, evacuation chain of sick and wounded animals was refined throughout the conflict, and um, animals were sent to veterinary hospitals, over 70 were established during the war. Gunshot, shrapnel injuries, those kinds of things were carefully treated, with surgery often taking place as required, and horses were given time to recuperate, so they had special convalescent depots where they were carefully monitored before being returned to duty. 
And overall, you know, they did a remarkable job. So two and a half million horses were treated and two million returned to duty. And I don't think anybody can sniff at that. Working closely with the ABC were animal charities such as the RSPCA and the Blue Cross, um, or as the Blue Cross were known back then, our Dumb Friends League. And here is a wonderful photo. I just love this one. It's again from the National Army Museum archives. Um, and it's um, an RSPCA horse ambulance, um, which would have been donated to the um, army um, with a rather sad looking horse on board. Uh, these charities were a very you know, major factor, essentially, um, in supporting the Army Veterinary Corps. They provided all kinds of things from um, practical things such as helping to build veterinary hospitals, supplies such as this, um, stables, um, medical equipment, but also things to help um, ABC staff, um, things like gramophones to keep their spirits up because they were working in very difficult conditions at times. Overall, you know, I'm very much of the opinion that the um, Army Veterinary Corps and the British Army as a whole did incredibly well at treating and caring for equines during the Great War. Um, mortality rates did fluctuate. Uh, the annual average was around 14%, which is remarkable and actually um, not far off the um, wastage of working horses in Britain at the time, and far better than that in the Boer War, which was uh, said around 70, 60, 70%. Um, Obviously, many thousands of horses and mules did perish, and it's very much important to place this in context of the horses' role in our society at the time, um, which was often utilitarian. Um, you know, these were working animals. We look at horses now as pets, and because that's really their predominant role in our lives, not the case back then. Um, so it's important to kind of put that into perspective when we look to commemorate and to remember these animals. Um, Highest period of loss, excluding the East African campaign, um, where Tetsi fly was just a huge, huge problem. Excluding that on the Western Front, um, 1917, uh, wastage increased to around, well, nearly 30%, which was very, very poor. Um, worth comparing British losses um, with other nations, just to give some idea of the success of the Army Veterinary Corps and, and how good British doctrine was around horse care. As you can see, the figures really speak for themselves, France, Germany and Austria having lost a much larger proportion of equines during the conflict. So many horses um, did die and this did became a problem in itself. So, you know, the bodies of these horses, the carcasses, they couldn't just be left on the battlefields. Um, so the disposal of animals branch of the Army Veterinary Corps was actually set up in 1917. Um, this consisted of pretty grimly named horse carcass economizer detachments. Um, it, it sounds really horrible, but it was very much necessary. Um, and what they did was essentially strip the, the carcasses of the horses down. They reused as much of the materials of, uh, of the horse as possible. So oil went towards Greece for shells, um, butchery. So horse meat was sold and even used to feed prisoners of war. Um, and between its formation and the armistice, um, the um, butchery departments processed something like 65,000 horses and mules. Um, but a, gr a great proportion of the losses were, were dealt with by the Army Veterinary Corps directly as well. Um, during the war and after, um, the, the welfare of cast horses, so this is um, horses that were no longer fit for military use, um, I tugged on the heartstrings of, of the British public and horror stories of worn out horses being sold into miserable lives abroad um, following loyal service um, really, really caused huge debates. Um, the fates that horses would um, would range, um, but this this big debate between um, sentimentality and practicality um, occurred, and very much not Britain's finest moment. Um, but the cost of the war um, and practicality prevailed over sentimentality and over really the welfare of horses. So, at the end of the war, horses were categorised, um, and initially the practice of disposal and demobilisation was applied only to those categorised as D, so those that were unfit to work or um, over a certain age. Um, but this was quickly um, expanded at times. Um, animals, some animals were repatriated, but um, many were sold off. Not such a problem in, in France and on the Western Front because animals were often sold, homes could be vetted easily um, and they were sold to working jobs, but generally cared for very well. However, in places like Egypt, um, the situation was somewhat different and the destruction of horses was very much deemed impractical and costly. So those animals that were categorized as D weren't, um, weren't killed, but were instead sold on. So these are animals that had already been 
um, categorised as unfit for work, already they were poorly and they were sold into work um, in a, a nation which had a very different culture of, of animal care. Um, and this was absolutely, you know, really a devastating thing for many horses and mules. They would be denied good standards of living and, you know, would end up just working themselves to death, albeit not in warfare. And their plight was famously um, um, recognised and campaigned on their behalf by um, Dorothy Brooke. And she sought to very much care for these veteran animals and opened uh, a, a charity and there's some incredible stories. Um, I recommend reading her diary and, and books on the, uh, the Brooke Foundation as well. She worked to give these animals a second chance and rehabilitate them. And that's something that the Brooke charity continues to do today um, for abused and overworked horses all over the world. And it highlighted really the image of the horse, not just as something an army surplus after the war, but as veterans of a conflict in a way that hadn't really occurred before. Um, so a few, around about 65,000 horses that were repatriated, um, they became figureheads really for animal welfare and for all of the horses that served. And indeed, one of the most famous examples are these guys, the Old Blacks, and they were a team of gun horses who served throughout the war. And they were chosen to pull the coffin of the unknown warrior to Westminster Abbey as a result of their hard work. Um, and Really, there are many examples of horses like Warrior um, so that we've got here. Um, and of course, you know, looking at the legacy of horses in war, War Horse is something by a book by Michael Mpergo, um, and of course, the stage play and latterly the film. You know, fantastic in telling the story of the War Horse, but perhaps doesn't do justice to the reality. Um, and, and I think really, the way the British Army handled the demobilisation of horses and the what happened to the veteran horses has overshadowed much of the brilliant work that was done beforehand. So whilst we now commemorate um, the war horses, so Animals in War Day, um, awards that were issued to animals, so you know the Dickens Medal um, that came into existence after the First World War, actually it's very important and does the best justice to them to remember them for how they actually served and the roles that they played and how they were well they were looked after by soldiers and what they meant to them during the war.